Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome along to this uh, latest in, in the installments of HDB webinars. Um, today, we are looking at um, technologies to enhance soil monitoring and crop management. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm David Wilson, uh, one of the knowledge exchange managers within HDB on the potato side. Um, today on this webinar, delighted to be joined um, by some fantastic people. Um, my colleague Alice Sin um, is on the webinar as well. Um, do a lot of things in the background um, and being a fantastic help. Um, we're also delighted to be joined by Jean Roberts and Tracy Valentine um, from the James Hutton Institute. Um, along with them, we have Andy Bilney from Lancaster University and Alice Milne from Ro uh, Rothamsted Research. Um, I will come on shortly to, to the topics they'll be covering, uh, but in the meantime, I'll just hand over quickly um, to a, another colleague of mine, uh, Laura Bouvet, just to explain a bit more about um, AgriTech Week. So go to the next slide, please. Thanks very much, David. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Laura Bouvet. I'm part of the team at Agritech E. Uh, we are a um, membership organisation bringing together farmers with researchers as well as tech developers who all want to see agritech and innovation as catalysts for change in agriculture and horticulture. Um, so this event is being part of Agritech Week, and this is actually our seventh Agritech Week. It's an event that's gained real traction as a partnership event uh, within the innovation ecosystem. And today we're delighted to have AHDB hosting. AHDB is one of our long-standing members and have been uh, with us since the very start of Agritech Week seven years ago. So uh, we're, we're delighted to uh, have them join us again uh, this week for what will be a really interesting event. So just to give you a bit of background uh, around Agritech Week. So uh, the aim of the week really is to showcase some of the exciting Agritech innovations underway from discovery research to on-farm practice and to provide a platform as well for some of our partners um, to show thought leadership around um, Agritech and, and innovations that, that are coming on in, in the field. So this week we uh, kicked off uh, with uh, ADAS and opportunities around remote sensing uh, and, um, and what this technology has to offer for field vegetables and, and potatoes. Yesterday we had our REAP conference uh, which, where we got to hear about the importance of uh, soil conservation and restoration from uh, global expert David Montgomery as well as some really exciting innovation in, uh, in soil uh, monitoring in our technology um, hub. Uh, for the rest of the week, uh, we'll also be exploring non-chemical crop protection, the impact of uh, COVID on our industry, as well as uh, farm, uh, farm waste uh, with our NIAB uh, event on Friday. Now, all that's left for me to say is uh, enjoy today, today's event, and we hope to see some of you throughout the rest uh, of Agritech Week. Um, thanks very much, and I'll now hand over to David. Thank you very much, Laura. If you have the next slide, please. Um, yeah, just to run through some, some housekeeping, um, you'll probably all be aware by now, um, but you, you're all on mute at the moment, so um, you, you can cough as loudly as you like and you, you won't interrupt us. Um, this um, event will be being um, uh, recorded, which we'll come on to. Um, with questions, um, obviously you, you can't speak up, but you'll notice that there's a chat function um, on the, the control panel down the side. So please do put any questions in there as you go. Um, we've set aside 10 minutes um, for each presenter with a few minutes for questions afterwards. Um, I'll try my best to, to keep some time, but we have got some great content here. Um, so I'd rather run slightly over um, than Cut you, cut you short in your prime. Um, there are, um, or there is a basis point available. Um, if you visit the the AgriTech e website, um, there's a thing there where you can find the event on there and register. But also, um, we have applied separately. So if you can please put your basis number and postcode in the the chat function, and it'll come through to ourselves. We can compile a list and add you to it. I mentioned this event is being recorded, um, so we will send a recording round of this event to uh, everyone who's registered. So if you do have to duck out, uh, do not worry, you, we will still capture it and it will be there on, on the YouTube channel to see afterwards. Um, finally, if you want to engage with us on, on social media, um, on Twitter, um, at HDB, and then um, hashtag Great Soils. Um, so back to today. Um, next slide, please. Um, we're going to look a bit about the, um, the, the Rotations Partnership and, and what we're doing. Um, and we're very um, honoured to have four great speakers here. Um, we have um, 
uh, Jean uh, Robertson from from JHI, who's going to show how the infrared technology can be used in um, um, identifying composition um, of soil. Um, then Tracy is going to cover some soil porosity um, slides. Um, Andy Bilney from Lancaster University, a um, bit more in soil competition, com soil compaction, um, and uh, EMI scanning there. And then last but no means least, um, uh, Alice Milne from Rothamsted is going to cover um, how this yield monitoring data and satellite imagery can be used to identify um, various parts of it for um, management of, of the fields. Um, but I will stop rambling on now and I will um, hand over to, to Jean Robertson. So thank you. Hello, my, my name is Jean Robertson and I'm going to be talking about um, using FTIR, which is an infrared spectroscopic technique uh, for the analysis of organic matter. Next, please. Um, I am a scientist working at James Hutton Institute in Aberdeen, but I'm also a partner in a mixed livestock and arable farming um, enterprise in Aberdeenshire. So I just thought I would throw in a few pictures of the farm just to give you some background. Next, please. First thing is, you think, well, why would we use infrared radiation for analysis? What can it, what can it tell us? Well, if you um, have infrared radiation and you put it through a sample, it will absorb that radiation at specific frequencies, depending on what the sample, or the composition of the sample. Next, please. And. So essentially what that does is it, it sort of allows us to see what something is made of. Something like soil, where you can't, you know, each one, if you pick it up and look at it, you wouldn't know, know exactly what it's made up of. This allows us to see what it's made up of. Next, please. And what we get is a chemical fingerprint or profile, and we call this an infrared spectrum. And this is which gives us the information. Next slide, please. So the pattern is something like we see here. So the sort of wavy lines with the, um, it's got peaks pointing down the way. And those are the ones that we identify. We look at where they are and it, we can uh, tell something about the nature of the sample. So um, next, please. The, as I say, it's, this is called a spectrum and it gives us the overall chemical profile. Next, please. And as you can see, I've put some arrows in and they've just pointed to different parts of this pattern, which can tell us about minerals and organic matter. So quite important thing about this technique is that it does both organic and minerals. So it gives us a complete overview of what the soil is like. Next, please. So, for example, if we've got a really mineral soil, what sort of things might we see? Well, it tells us about the geology of the soil and it includes the things like the proportion and nature of the clay minerals. So, for example, the pattern I've got here, we can see it's got a lot of quartz present and it's also got a lot of, uh, it's got quite a appreciable amount of kaolinite. And we can see that there's some organic matter, but it's a small amount. So it allows us also to rapidly assess the nature and amount of organic matter, even in a mineral soil. Next, please. But in terms of the soil organic matter, we think, well, what can it tell us? Now, the pattern I've got here on the left with all the question marks is of a very organic soil. And all those peaks that we can see tell us something about the nature of that. So we need to think about what sort of information can it give us? Well, the pattern is um, related to that of the undecomposed vegetation. So depending on what your vegetation is going into the soil, it's going to change what the organic matter looks like. But also it will change depending on um, how decomposed it is. So this is a pattern, the organic matter in the soil, the pattern that we see arises from the vegetation and then the processes that it undergoes through degradation. And we can pick up things like the amount of polysaccharide, the amount of protein, the amount of lignin, which is the backbone from the plants that are, are in, in the soil. Next, please. But as well as actually giving us an insight into the soil, we can actually use the patterns to predict properties of the soil. If we relate them statistically, and uh, the patterns that we get to measured soil properties, we can allow, it allows us to predict those properties. And it can be from a single spectrum, we can get a whole lot of predictions 
per percent carbon, percent nitrogen, pH, bulk density. And what we find is that for soil organic carbon, the, um, the predictions we get by FTIR are very accurate. Next, please. So in this project, um, what were the key aspects we wanted to look at using the FTIR technique? First thing was, can we study a variation in soil organic matter quality through a rotation? Second thing was, can we study the influence of amendments in soil, for example, addition of farmyard manure on the soil organic matter and its quality? And thirdly, can we actually relate the spectral data to the organic matter quality and then link that to physical properties of the soil? For example, something like uh, water stable aggregation. Next, please. So in the first part of what we were doing, um, we spent some time analysing soils um, after cover crops, cover crop soils, that was soils that were um, under cover crops between, um, between, I think, barley planting. So this was done for two growing seasons, and we also actually had a very small pilot in the, the year before that. And each time we looked at 72 soil samples because we had three replicates of eight different treatments, and the treatments are listed um, down on the left-hand side, everything from a control to different, mix, different um, mixes, some with... Um, with clover um, and a whole range of different things. And as I say, we, we compared it with a stubble control. Next, please. And when we looked at the spectra of the different soil samples and the, the, the carbon that we, we could see, they were brought, the, the 2018 samples were broadly similar to those of 2017. But in 2017, we actually saw, we had a few specific um, cases where there was definitely a, a large enhancement of the carbon and also of the sort of um, protein type um, element of the organic matter. Um, and we didn't see that in 2017 we saw that in 2017, but not 2018. We think this was because of a very different growing seasons. But we were able to show that we could see differences in the soil due to the rotation. And also, we produced quite accurate um, calibration results for the soil organic carbon. Uh, the graph there maybe looks slightly scattered, but if you look at the scale on it, the, um, it's actually the errors in it are very small. So that worked quite well. Next, please. And another part of our study has been in looking at the characterization of soils under different long-term treatments. And for this, we um, took some plots from um, the long-term experiments at Rothamsted, the, the Broadbalk and Hoosfield, and we looked at the variation in the series of soils which had undergone addition of farmyard manure. And we compared that with um, addition of N PKMG and an unfertilized control. And each time we had eight time points, which were going over about 150 years, which were selected for all treatments. Next, please. And as I say here, the broad bulk was under, had been under continuous wheat and the hoose field had been under continuous barley. And so, as I say, our samples range from sort of about 1865 through to um, 2015 for the broad bulk and from 1889 to 2018. So we, as I say, and we were comparing farmyard manure, the NPK, MG and a nil addition. Next, please. Now the differences, um, as I say, for somebody who's not used to looking at FGIR spectra, which is almost everybody, these will not just appear like a lot of squiggly lines. But in actual fact, if we look at them, we can actually see differences in the pattern, small differences in the pattern between the the different treatments. And these are subtle but very evident, which are telling us that there have been changes in the soil and the nature of the soil due to the different types of treatment. And also we can see that over time there has been um, a big change as well. And as I say again, these are quite subtle things to look at, but what we are intending to do is to um, relate these to other known properties of, of these plots. Next, please. 
Now, the broadbulk wheat is in a plot which is not far away, I think, from the Hoos field. So again, the soils are kind of similar. But yes, we again, we see differences between the treatments and variations between the plots by sampling date. So we've definitely got an insight. And at the moment, the next thing we need to do is to study what we found in relation to what's known about the crops grown on these plots. Next, please. So in conclusion, there's lots of things that we can do with FGIR spectral data. It's a powerful technique. We can um, accurately predict the concentration of um, percent carbon in the, in the soil using the spectral data. We can also predict other measures which can be useful. Uh, for example, we can predict um, bulk density, which can also allow to, uh, us to um, work out carbon stocks especially where, uh, in places where this may not have been measured. The aggregate stability measurements that we've done at some points have also been shown to correlate to IR spectral data. And um, we will be um, lo looking to make further links between the nature of the soil organic matter and the soil physical properties in the studies which are ongoing at the moment. Interpretation of the FDIR spectra of the amended soils also provides valuable information on the changes in the amount and um, chemical composition of the soil organic matter. So FTIR can give us measures, it can also give us insight, and there's further potential for other things to be correlated to the soil spectra, including things like yields, so directly correlating yields to the soil spectra. So all in all, from the studies that we've done so far, we um, conclude that the FTIR will be a powerful tool for the future. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, we have got some questions coming in, but in the interest of time, I'll probably um, say then we'll have a sort of panel Q&A if you're happy with that. Um, and we'll keep, keep the ball rolling. So, yeah, without further ado, I will now pass over to, to Tracy Valentine um, to go into um, some multi-spectral imaging um, around soil porosity. So thank you very much, Jean, and we will catch you. you towards the back end. Hello. Um, said I'm Tracy Valentine and I'm going to talk about soil porosity um, and multispectral cameras to um, do some analysis around that. But uh, next slide. Okay so um, as many of you know uh, there's a lot of changes going on in farming at the moment um, particularly um, things making rotations slightly more complicated um, a lot of people are swapping across to no-till systems from traditional inversion ploughs, um, an increase in cover crop usage, and um, also perhaps reduction in spraying maybe along the, the line as well. Um, all of these things have an impact on the soil, and some of the other data that we have, that uh, these changes also then have a knock-on effect on different varieties. And so we're trying to understand um, how the change in the, the soil structure that um, comes about from these different changes, how that impacts on roots of the crop varieties and then how that impacts on the yields. So next slide, please. So as I said, the, these, these system changes have an impact on the soil most important things that happens is a change in the pore structure um, and also the soil strength and we know from previous work that the combination of the two has a massive impact on the the way roots grow through soil and, and it can either impede or um, mitigate if, if you've got the right shape of pores and the right size of pores within the soil even within a quite strong soil you can mitigate that that effect of the soil strength um, so, in order to try and understand what's going on in the pore structure of these, these soils, um, traditionally you've had a couple of different methods. One is um, CT analysis, where you can get images of soil, um, and the other is um, doing water release curves from which you can calculate the different pore structures from it. Um, both of the methods have advantages. Um, the, the CT gives you very detailed detail, but it relies on um, using quite expensive equipment and the, the 
time it takes to get an image is quite long and it's quite difficult um, as far as computational analysis to, to get the information out. And the, the soil water release curves um, relies on sucking water out of soils. And it, it can take several months for each sample to be processed. And um, so we wanted to develop a different way of doing things. Um, so next slide, please. So why multispectral imaging? Well, along with multispectral imaging, I, I should say that we're also using simple RGB imaging. So as Jean said, um, different parts of the, the spectrum can tell you different things about, um, about the object you're looking for. And different, different samples reflect the light in different ways. And a simple RGB image, which is what you would take with your, your cat and standard camera, um, gives you three areas of that in the red, green, and blue um, part of the spectrum. Um, but multispectral cameras can give you that um, information, but cut into very small, much smaller segments. So, for example, um, a bit like a rainbow, you, you would have several different colours within that. And the cameras that we've been using um, go from the, the lower end of the visible spectrum, and they actually go part of the way into the infrared spectrum. So they also capture some areas of the, the light that is beyond the, the spectrum that we can use here as the human eye. Um, while it gives you a very different quality of information to the, the technique that um, Jean's using, um, you do still get different information depending on um, the, the actual um, sample that you're looking at. So um, next slide, please. So we've been developing a method based on um, a couple of different cameras. So um, one is, um, has 16 different wavelengths and the other one has 25 different wavelengths, going, as I said, going into the infrared. Um, and this is an overview of the system that we've developed. So effectively, um, we go out into our fields, we sample um, from the fields, we can sample at different depths. We equilibrate the water because that's quite important in our reflection measurements. Uh, we split the cores, soil cores in half, um, then we image the broken surface and, and the structure of the soil um, determines how the, the, the actual soil sample breaks. And then we do image analysis on it and then we can combine the sample information from all the different samples that we have. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, these uh, cameras that we were using, they, they cover a wide range, a wider range than the visible spectrum. And they, because of the type of cameras they are, um, it, it, you get an image a bit like a, a, a standard picture. But if you look at the pictures on the right, you can see that they're actually made up of um, lots and lots of different pixels where you've got a cluster from these different spectra. Um, so you have 16 or 25. So if you next slide, please. So the sort of information we get from this is, I'm just gonna walk you through what we do with the images. So the image on the left is the top left is the sort of image we get. Um, we then split it into the 16 different images, which represent the 16 different wavelengths you could get out of this camera. We've set up a system that can automatically extract the part of the image um, that is actually the soil because it's within the soil core. Um, and then from that, you can get effectively 16 different individual wavelengths that describe that soil. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, from that point, we have a system where we start to actually look at the structure of the soil. So uh, the image on the left, you can see there's lots of little red um, lines on it. And this is where the software has um, decided where the edge of the cores are. And at that point, we can split it into areas of the information that we class as within the structures and then areas with, that are out with the structures. And we can manipulate that depending on what we actually want to look at. Um, so then you get further data at this point where you, can, you get the 16 wavelengths, but inside and outside. And then if you go to the next slide, please. Um, from that point, we can start looking at actual individual um, 
data from within the structures. So each structure can then have its own um, information associated with that, um, with the data from that image. Um, and on the left, we've got a coloured image from an extraction where we've quantified the different sizes of the pores. We can do um, perimeter, and you can also get information about the, diff the actual um, bias from the different wavelengths. So you might have an area that's biased towards the red or biased towards the violet area of the spectrum, for example. Um, we can pull histograms of the shapes and the sizes of the different pores from those kind of images. So next slide, please. So what have we been doing this? Well, as I said, we're interested in rotations and how um, the soil changes in rotations. So we've been using two sites, um, mainly that are on the JHI um, site. So one is Greaves House Tillage Platform, which its main aim is to look at um, different till two different tillage systems, so conventional and no tillage systems, but it also has different cropping systems within that. And the other one is the Centre for Sustainable Cropping, which is a a six-year rotation over six fields, um, which are split into two different management systems. Um, so next slide, please. So we've, we've sampled these over three years, and although I don't have the complete data to show you, I just pulled out a few examples of where we've done this analysis. So when we take the, so, um, take loose soil around and we repack this at a known density, um, and this is a kind of controlled way of, of looking at this. So you can see the one on the intact core on the left. Um, the system has pulled out is very different from the one on the right where we repacked it. So if you if you take soil and you break it up a bit like you would with a, a plough system, but this is done artificially, um, you change the pore structure, and you can see that the system is picking this up in a in a in a way. Um, so next slide, please. And these are two examples from the two different ca cameras. So this is exactly the same soil core. So you can see that because the systems are picking up slightly different parts of the spectra, the, um, the overall structure is not exactly the same, um, but the overall impression is the same. So we'll get similar um, curves from each one. Um, but if we go to the next slide, um, what we can do is we can take the analysis from out of these two different cameras and also combine it with the one that we use from an RGB system, which works in exactly the same way, but is much higher um, resolution. We can combine them and then start saying, what's the difference between these different treatments? So I've just pulled a small amount of the data just to give you an idea of um, the sort of things that we can do with the system. So if you look at the top um, left graph, um, you can see that certainly under the, the ones on the R section of the graph, um, you can see that the, the blue and the, the red lines are slightly separated. Um, and this is just simply between the different rotations. So this is one rotation in the spring has the soil uncovered during the winter, whereas the winter rotation, it's covered all year round, but not necessarily the same crops. Um, you can also um, separate um, the uh, cores that have been repacked from the ones that are, are intact, purely based on the structural analysis coming out of the, the little histograms of the, the pore sizes. Um, and the one on the right just gives you a little bit more detailed about the, the sort of histograms that we can get out. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so just as a summary, so, so we've developed this system um, based on the reflection of the multi-spectral and also on the high-resolution high RGB images. And it, it allows us to extract these features um, and give, a, give it a description of the features plus an element of the actually what they're composed of, um, but not as much detail as what, what Gene's method does. Um, and that allows us to track the changes across the, the fields. Um, so at the moment, it's just comparing different treatments, but um, we've, we're processing samples at the moment that has a time element to it. Um, and we're also just doing a comparison at the moment between 
um, what the, the, the method gives out as well as more traditional methods like the water release curves, but obviously that, that takes a significant amount of time to process. Um, and as Jean said, the aim is to also look at how um, the output of this system relates to the performance of the crops in the field that we get. And that, that's my last slide. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, really interesting stuff in there. Um, and it shows by the questions that are coming in. Um, again, in the interest of time, um, we will we'll carry on to um, to Andy, to our, to our next speaker. Um, but if you're, um, yeah, if people want to have any questions, please enter them into the the question and chat function. And likewise, um, if you want to register for for basis points, if you pop your numbers and postcodes in there, we will get back to you. But I will I'll stop waffling now and um, hand over to Andy. Thanks, David. Um, my name's Andy Binley. I'm at uh, Lancaster University in the Environment Centre. Um, I've been working on with geophysics for some time for groundwater and uh, soil problems, uh, working over a range of scales. And I, I want to use this opportunity to just talk about how we've been using geophysical methods for looking at soil compaction. Um, I should acknowledge here my PhD student, Guillaume Blanchy, um, who has actually done the measurements that I'm going to show later on. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what I want to do is, is give a flavor for geophysics in an agricultural context. Um, geophysics has been around for, for some time. In fact, you can go back a century to look at, can, can we go back? Can we go back to the previous slide? Can we have the previous slide? Okay, maybe not. Oh. All right, so next slide. Uh, can we move to this? Okay, we got it. All right. Um, so geophysics has been around for some time, and in fact, for for a century. Um, we go back to uh, to the earlier 20th century, where geophysics has been was developed for for mineral exploration. Um, and uh, the concept here is that we are doing a a non-invasive or a minimally minimally invasive measurement of some property of the soil or the subsurface, for example, electrical conductivity. And what we're interested in is using that as a proxy for a measure of something of interest, for example, soil moisture content. Um, in a exploration context, mineral exploration context, we might be using electrical conduct conductivity to tell us about the, the uh, availability of, of certain minerals within the subsurface. So we're not measuring something directly here, we're measuring something which is a proxy. And as we illustrate in this uh, cartoon here, uh, we might be doing acoustic measurements or seismic measurements, um, electrical measurements, um, electromagnetic measurements. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so um, although the techniques have been used for some time in various uh, areas, over the past decade or so, there's been a, a rapid expansion on the use of geophysical techniques in agriculture. And this has been driven by their minimally invasive uh, measurement approach, uh, the opportunity to scale to large areas, and also the opportunity to use mobile and monitoring platforms. And 
So I've got some uh, illustration of kind of approaches that are used here, electrical measurements on the left and electromagnetic measurements on the right, illustrating the use of mobile uh, platforms. The monitoring platforms are, are also important uh, too, because new technologies now are available for us to be able to look at changes in geophysical properties. And that's relevant when we're looking at, at uh, for example, soil moisture changes, as we'll see later. Next slide. I think there might be a delay. Oh, here we go. All right, so I'm going to focus on uh, looking at electrical conductivity of soils. And the uh, electrical conductivity tells us the ease at which electrical current will pass through a soil. And that's primarily controlled by the fluid which is in the pore space. So a drier soil will have a lower conductivity, a wetter soil will have a higher conductivity. If we've got clay particles within our soil, then they, because of their electrical uh, makeup, they tend to uh, enhance the conductivity too. But we're dominated by the um, uh, fluid content within the within the uh, within the soil. So conductivity is potentially usable as a proxy for soil moisture. Um, it's also potentially uh, valuable for looking at salinity of soils, so changes in the ionic composition of the uh, of the pore fluid or the on the soil surface. Next slide, please. We can measure conductivity indirectly, uh, non-invasively, using uh, two techniques which I'm going to uh, illustrate here. On the left, we can use what are called electrical resistivity measurements, resistivity being the inverse of conductivity, uh, and on the right, electromagnetic measurements. Both of them are sensitive to the electrical conductivity of the soil. On the left, we need to use electrodes inserted into the soil to take a measurement. On the right, we do a, a inductive measurement, so there's no need for any uh, contact with the soil. Next slide, please. So, the electrical resistivity measurements, and sometimes this is referred to as electrical resistivity tomography or ERT. We drive current between two electrodes, here shown as A and B, and then we measure the voltage difference between two other electrodes. And that um, senses the electrical conductivity of the soil beneath the electrodes. We can increase the spacing of these electrodes in order to be able to look deeper. And what we typically do is carry out a series of measurements by moving the electrodes along a profile and changing the spacing between the electrodes so that they're actually we can build up then a vertical section. And we can do this in 3D as well and build up a three-dimensional volume of the subsurface. We do need contact with the soil to be able to do these measurements. Next slide, please. EMI measurements, electromagnetic induction measurements, work in a completely different principle. With this, we generate an electromagnetic field with a transmitter and then a receiver on the other end of the probe looks at a secondary electromagnetic field. And that secondary electromagnetic field is created by conductors which are in the subsurface. 
So this kind of, this principle is is what's used actually for for metal detection, but we can also use it at much higher sensitivity levels to look at variations in conductivity, which might be, for example, due to changes in moisture. Now these techniques have been around for for some time. The EMI measurements have are, are proving to be very popular in agricultural applications because the measurements are rapid and they are non-invasive and so they can actually you can uh, attach these to a mobile platform and cover large areas relatively easily what's also developed uh, over the past few years is that um, new instruments are available which have multiple receivers and that allows us to measure multiple depths of investigation um, at, at one location. So we can get rapid coverage of two or three dimensional variation in conductivity within the subsurface. Next slide, please. Seem to have a bit of a oh, okay. We got it. So we've been using these techniques uh, in in a, in a number of um, app, applications, uh, and I'm just going to show you some results from from one study that uh, that we've done recently um, at uh, NIAB uh, research site in Cambridge uh, as part of an AHDB funded project, and and in this application we were interested in the effect of uh, irrigation and drought stress on on potato crops and the impact of compaction and so we done EMI measurements as well as resistivity measurements to look at variations in uh, a number of plots uh, throughout different times of the year and if we go to the next slide please Here are some some results just to illustrate um, what we've been seeing with the uh, with the geophysical measurements. We've got a contrast here between our compacted and uncompacted plots, and also between our irrigated and drought stressed plots. And the red zones here, this is a vertical section in each of the plots, and the red zones indicate the uh, resistive soils, so the non-conductive soils, whereas the uh, cooler colors are indicating the conductive uh, soils or parts of the, of the domain. And what we can see here, particularly in the uncompacted dry uh, plot down on the bottom right, you can see how the soil is getting much more resistive at depth. So this is indicating a drying zone of our of our soil, which may not come as a great surprise here, given that we got uncompacted uh, a dry system. But the point is that we can actually see the differences here with our uh, conductive measurements. Now, the the key uh, uh, challenge here is actually to 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 get some interpretation of this in a in a quantitative manner. And so we've actually also been exploring how we can relate the electrical conductivity measurements to to soil moisture, because after all, we're looking at variations in soil moisture here due to um, the uh, compacted versus uncompacted nature. Um, so we're we've been exploring how to improve the the knowledge of relationships between soil moisture changes and our electrical conductivity measurements. Um, 
and that would allow us then to actually give, give quantitative estimates of the the effect of the uh, uh, changes to the to the system. Next slide, please. And the the study has been been a small part of a of a larger project which has been um, uh, run by Ian Dodd and Katrina Huntenberg at uh, Lancaster, um, where they've been looking at the uh, shoot growth in these plots. So we've been combining the geophysical data and the direct measurements uh, of the crops. Uh, to be able to come up with some uh, interpretation of these data. Next slide, please. Um, just to to kind of close here i've shown an example of some uh small plots the key advantage is that with these geophysical measurements we can actually move to much larger scales so we've been focusing on some small plot experiments but these kind of measurements that we're doing can be actually taken up to a larger scale and a number of commercial organizations are offering these kind of services uh to look over over entire fields the key thing here is that they're often done in, as a snapshot at one point in time. What our work is, is, is illustrating is that we need to be able to do measurements over time to be able to come up with a quantitative interpretation. So a single snapshot may give some information about variations in soil texture in a site, but to actually try to quantify variations due to soil moisture uh, say, for example, throughout the growing season, we need to be taking measurements over time. The next slide. And there's just another illustration here on how these measurements could be could be used, for example, to look at impacts of compaction due to soil machinery. Uh, this is part of a, an ADAS funded project, uh, which Pete Shanahan ran at, uh, at at Lancaster, using electrical geophysical measurements to to look at variations in the soil compaction um, due to uh, uh, soil machinery. Uh, uh, agricultural machinery. Um, so next slide. And just to finish here, there's a link uh, for uh, a paper which is open access uh, which you can download and has got a number of case studies illustrating the kind of uh, applications in agriculture of some of the techniques that I've mentioned here. And I'll finish there. Thank you very much, Andy. Apologies, we seem to be having a, a bit of a delay in getting the, the slides to you. Um, so apologies for that. Um, yeah, good questions coming in still and, um, and basis. Um, point requests so um yeah please continue to, to pop your questions in there um and yeah that was some really good interesting stuff there there andy we'll we'll come back to you for q a at the end um but in the interest of time i'll now hand over to alice um just to, to run through the yield monitoring and, and satellite imagery um presentation and we will um resume again afterwards so over to you alice thank you okay thank you so um my name's alice mill and i'm going to talk about using yield monitor data and satellite imagery to identify zones for differential management. And this is work that I've done with Kirsty Hassel and Andy Whitmore, and we're all from Rothamsted. Next slide, please. So um, this project is 
part of the larger program of management of rotation, soil structure and water, which is funded by the AHDB and led by Mark Allison at NIAB. Next slide, please. So yield monitor data have been collected as standard in arable systems for some time, and these data can be used to map the yield variation across a field. So on the right, you can see this sort of plot. It's a plot of raw data from a yield monitor, and it shows how the yield changes across the field. Next slide, please. So more recently, yield monitors have been fitted to potato harvesters, and in our project, we wanted to investigate how these data might help to inform management. And specifically, we asked, can these data be useful for benchmarking performance? Can these data be used to inform management zones? And if not, can we predict useful zones from other remote or proximal sense data? And then importantly, how can farmers make best use of this information? Next slide, please. So we had data from approximately 60 potato fields. And with this, we produced a prototype benchmarking tool that allows the user to determine how their field compares with other fields on their farm or in their region. And you can see that here, um, this particular field is yielding just under 40 tonnes per hectare. And the um, app allows you to compare that to, to other yields from, from the region. And of course, this type of information can be included in any standard benchmarking tool and there's potential to filter on your farm or your region or perhaps your soil type. However, our key interest in this project is not between field variation, but within field variation and, and how we might manage that. Next slide, please. So for serial data, um, we've shown that given a number of seasons of yield monitor data, we can derive management zones using a method called fuzzy cluster classification. Um, so in this example shown here, we have five seasons of yield monitor data, and we've used that to derive um, the management zones that you can see on the very right hand side there. So we have three management zones. So in this type of analysis, we might pick up um, areas of the field that perhaps consistently yield more poorly than average or perhaps consistently yield um, better than average. And importantly, we pick up zones that vary from year to year. So if, for example, you had an area of the field that was prone to drought, then that area might be seen to perform really well in a wet season, but particularly badly in, in a dry season. So the subtlety here with this method is that mm -hmm. we don't just define high and low yielding areas of the field. We can pick out um, these zones with seasonal variation. So our question was, can, can the same be done with the potato yield monitor data? Next slide, please. Um, next, please. So the first thing that we discovered was that potato yield monitor data are particularly prone to gaps. And so we needed to advance our statistical methods to cope with data sparsity. And um, Kirsty did this analysis and, and wrote a scientific publication on that topic. Next, please. So our next question is, does potato yield data um, show coherent zones that are large enough for management? And we found that, yes, this was the case. And this is illustrated in this one example here where you can see zones formed on the field and these relate to um, variation in, in yield across across the field. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so one thing that we did find was that a, a key limitation with the approach was that currently there aren't enough years of um, potato yield monitor data for any one particular field. In the examples that we had, we only had one year's worth of um, potato yield monitor data. So therefore, we turn to other sources of remote sense data, such as um, serial yield monitor data that would be in the rotation and also NDVI data. Next slide, please. So we found that um, yield monitor data from other crops um, held great promise, 
but again there was a limitation and this was that if the field was rented then then the um, farmer who wished to grow potatoes wouldn't necessarily have access to that yield monitor data so we decided that ndvi would be the best approach to to explore so ndvi is essentially obtained from satellite imagery and you can see on the top left hand um, panel there some satellite imagery and it's essentially an index of spectral reflectance that typically is used to measure greenness. So we um, essentially we define our field boundary and then we can extract NDVI measures from across various seasons, um, which is illustrated in the bottom left hand corner. So we were able to extract um, two reasonable NDVI measures across um, three seasons. And then from that, we were able to form um, these potential management zones, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner. But then the question is, are the um, zones that we derive from the NDVI, are, are they actually a reflection of the yield variation and therefore suitable to help us think about management? Next slide, please. So we found that in many situations, yes, the, the zones that were predicted from NDVI did give a good indication of how the potato monitor, um, potato yield varied across the field. And you can see that in this top panel here. So our NDVI has enabled us to um, detect this uh, salmon zone, which is around the edge of the field, which um, performed quite poorly compared to the, the blue zone, which performed the best. Next, please. But then in, um, in other cases, the zones didn't reflect the yield variation um, terribly well. And that there can be lots of reasons for this. So perhaps, um, perhaps that there isn't a huge amount of variation in our particular field, or perhaps the, uh, the factor that's affecting the potato yields isn't captured in the NDVI data. Next, please. So we've included the yield zoning in our benchmarking tool. So this allows the user to visualize the zones based upon the potato yields. And um, next, please. And then perhaps of, of more interest, the user can also consider the zones from particular field within the context of zones from fields across their farm or um, across the region. So this might tell you whether it's actually worth um, trying to think about managing your fields differentially. Next, please. Oh, you've gone backwards. Okay. Um, so actually, can, can you play through the whole of this slide? So I didn't realize this was going to come out one, but perfect. Thank you. Um, so NDVI derived from satellite imagery can be used to form zones and we found that for some fields the yield response um, varied according to zone and, and others not. So the NDVI data only gets us so far. It can be used to form zones but it doesn't tell us whether um, we should manage those zones differently or how we should manage them. So for this we need to integrate other sources of information. So for example if we have more years of potato yield monitor data that could be really helpful um, but really importantly the, the farmer knowledge needs to be integrated next please so to explore this um, we plan to have some workshops to uh, investigate the, the the methods that we developed with with farmers and in particular to get um, farmers views on the benchmarking tool um, to zone their particular fields and to um, ask them for their interpretation of those zones, how they might want to use the management zones and what we could do to improve our methods. And also to uh, determine what other sources of information could help to improve how we use these data. Next, please. But unfortunately, um, for obvious reasons, those didn't go ahead. Next. So our, our fallback plan is to hold some um, online workshops using voting and commenting software. And the first of these is planned for the 31st 
um, annual Cambridge Potato Conference. And in this, we hope to get some preliminary feedback and ideas of how we can more fully realise the potential in this data source. Next, please. So um, it just remains for, for me to thank uh, Kirsty and Andy, um, particularly Kirsty, who's done most of the analysis in the project, and um, Andy, who's the lead from uh, Rothamsted on this project. He's, he's also working on organic amendments in relation to the, the wider project, and to, again, acknowledge this is part of the management of rotations and soil structure and water project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, if I could ask the rest of our um, presenters to put their cameras back on, um, but rather than giving you a, a moment's piece, um, Alice, I'll, I'll turn the, the first question towards you, but also bring um, Andy in on this as well, if I may. Um, a question has come in. Um, how about combining the EMI data with the yield data to produce management zones? I think that's um, that's a really good idea and and something that we've explored to some extent in the past um but i think certainly that that's something that andy and i should discuss perhaps next week andy at the wider meeting sorry just just to yeah i think, you I there, think that's definitely the way to go i, I mean, think that's that definitely the way to go with this So it would it would certainly help to um, e explore, um, particularly the, the the compaction issues that that may relate. So yes, definitely. And well, well, we have you on, Andy. Um, um, have you um, done any work on variable rate cultivations? Um, and have you done anything with the topsoil mapper? Simple, simple answer is no. Um, uh, to 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 both both questions. Um, it, it, could you elaborate on that? Are you able to elaborate on that, David? A bit. Um, we, we can. It's a question that, that's come in. Uh, we can. Um, yeah. Always. We, we can. We can come back to that, and we can. We can pick it up offline. Say any questions we we don't have answered. I can. I can get in touch with the okay. people asking the questions yeah. and, and build on that. Um, if we if we, we jump about slightly and um, go to to Jean, um, quite a few um, questions that have, have come in, um, are based around the, the FTIR. Um, so how um, how would you carry out the, the FTIR practically in a field to get undisturbed bulk density? And is this um, I'm supposed to build that? Is this technique um, potentially useful for measuring soil organic carbon and carbon trading purposes um, at the same time? Yeah, I mean the the use of the thing directly in the field we're still developing because there's um obviously soil in the field is very um heterogeneous and there's wet and it can be you know variable and um, so we're actually in the process of trying to um work on analysis in the field but yes the the bulk density um we can do at the moment if in the laboratory by what we do is we take uh, measured known bulk densities for a particular soil spectra we correlate them and then we can predict them we've actually done this um yeah there's been papers for the when they looked at the carbon stocks across scotland where we used the spectral data to predict bulk densities for legacy um samples and yeah there there, there should there's a lot of potential for using this for me measuring soil organic carbon and that's something um as i say we've just recently published a paper to show um that the particular ftir method we use can give very accurate results and as i say we're looking to move this into being able to do it in the field so yeah there's a lot of potential a bit more work to be done though before we get there that's that's really good um it's so another one that's um come in um i suppose it's to um yourself gene and um and tracy was um it, it's more if you can't measure it um you can't treasure it could any of these technologies be regularly and inexpensively used by farmers themselves in the future um for monitoring soil content and quality and take actions to improve it I don't know if Tracy wants to go first or I suppose the, the thing I would say is it's obviously the cameras that we use at the moment are, are relatively expensive but the more they're being used the the lower the price is, is coming and um, so in that respect 
yes, there may be a point when the, the price of the technology has come down enough, um, or there's alternatives um, that, that work in a similar way that it will be able to use in a monitoring way. The, the software itself that we've developed um, runs on a standard PC. Right, that's positive. So, and then, yeah, yeah. So I mean, another, another build for, for Eugene as well. Someone said, um, uh, could the FTIR um, be used by farmers and growers to assess their soils, or is it more of a research tool, which I suppose again is a build on the accessibility of it? It's, um, I think our aim is that it will be accessible, um, certainly to people's um, soil sampling um, and perhaps to, to you know, a bit down the line to um, far farmers um, themselves, um, because at the moment, it expensive but there's a lot of people interested in in coming up with um, lower cost um, devices which will do the same job as I say if we get the um, the work done to um, get it working well in the field um, as I say the the potential will be yes yeah, certainly I mean to, to be able to use it because a bit of kit at the moment is pretty expensive the handheld one is like about 25 thirty thousand for one um having said that in prices of tractors and for the amount of analysis you can do the thing about it is if we get it working in the field that you will be able to do um very kind of um you can do the space you can decide to sample as much as you want you know either both by time or by um across the field i mean at the moment i've done many on our farms where you do a w walk across a massive field and make one soil sample this should be able to you know in the future we are hoping that it will be something which can be taken on farm and analyze across a whole lot of different points and come into this idea of um, management zones as well because it could also provide further information for that but as i say we're working towards that but we're not quite there yet Perfect. Um, another question here for, for Tracy. Um, are the multispectral images 2D or 3D? Um, and how big is the soil core from which the image is from? Um, just wondering how these images relate to the whole field scenario slash soil system as there'll be variation within fields. Um, but we're working on a, at the moment, it involves actually breaking a core. So um, you don't get you don't get a three-dimensional image in the way that you do with CT. Um, you're limited by the amount of cores you're willing to take and break. Um, but the actual imaging is very quick. Um, and the the aim is to, to make the, the analysis as quickly as possible. So, so it allows you to take multiple images a lot quicker than you would do if you were do using something like CT. Fantastic. And then uh, uh, sticking on, on samples, um, back to you, Jean. Um, do, the, do the soil samples have to be dried down to the same moisture content before analysis? Um, the the lab-based ones are done. We do them dried and milled and we get the really accurate results. As I say, what we're, we're working on is ways of doing it in the field where you have very variable moisture. Um, you know, in, in Scotland, there's very rarely such a thing as a dry soil. Um, it really can be, and it can be variable. So there's ways of taking account of that, and that's part of the development work that we're doing. So um, at the moment, to get the you know lab-based um, work, um, you do need to mill them and dry them. Having said that, you can actually, from one um, one scan, you can um, predict a whole range of uh, different parameters. So it is still, you know, beneficial. But no, the the, the moisture is an, an issue, but it's one that we're working to deal with. Thank you. This is a it's a question that possibly will affect them all. Is um, how the man-made bits are, are affecting um, soil and reading, um, and how. Um, the amount of, um, well, especially electricity, conductivity in the soil, um, how that's affected by dissolved salts, i.e. Sort of fertilisers, nutrients and bagged fertilisers, slurry, etc. in solution. Um, and I imagine that will have a huge effect on, on the various treatments, um, especially on the um, electric conductivity. Is this, is this a problem? Yeah, so the it is a problem uh, in the if you wanted to look at uh, soil moisture, for example, um, 
and you've got variations in the ionic composition of the pore fluid, which might be due to fertilizer application and so on. So you need to be able to remove the different effects in your in your interpretation. You could also use it to an advantage. In, in some cases, you might be interested in looking at that variation in ionic composition. And in fact, the geophysical methods are used widely in some parts of the world to look at soil salinity. Um, so the key thing is you've actually got to work out which thing is actually changing your conductivity the most um, and, and, uh, and, and make sure that uh, um, you're not affected by the, by the, other, um, by the other factors. And then I'll build on that for you, Gene. Another question has come in about um, could the FTIR tool um, be used to measure quantity of nitrogen, phosphorus, and other chemicals in the soil? Yeah, I mean, we have, um, as I say, we get good measures for uh, for nitrogen concentration in the soil. And um, phosphorus is possible, but it's not as good. There's some of the, as I say, some of the um, me measures are better than others. You um, Carbon, nitrogen are very good, pH, um, bulk density. Um, also things like um, MG is pretty good. There's it's variations in some of the other ones, but yeah, there's a, the whole whole range of different things it it can be used for. Um, as I say, well, and we've actually tried um, looking a bit at um, different, you know, for example, phosphorus. Um, which has been analysed in different ways to see, you know, we're still working on that to see um, which, you know, which are best reflect, reflected by the spectra. But yeah, um, phosphorus is probably um, not as good as we would like it, but a lot of the other ones are actually, um, would give, yeah, we get very useful results from. And we could actually, talking about what Andy's um, been talking about in terms of things which alter the, um, the conductivity that's somewhere where perhaps you know something like FTIR can actually say you know, we can see what's going on to a large extent for some for some of the changes you might not for everything we won't see salts particularly but for some of the other things it's possible that there could be sort of useful input to um, to that from it from the FTIR. Fantastic. Well, I mean, there's one final question. Um, just Alice, bring you back in. Um, finishing a potato subject, I couldn't help myself. Um, people are asking if, if there's, um, obviously it's been covered, it's a positive it's been missed, but there's a lot of, um, there'll be correlation between the, the cereal yield mapping and then the potato ones. Is it throwing up as many questions as it is answers with differences between the crops in the same areas? Um, we we actually had quite a limited set of data where we had the, the cereal and potato yield monitor in, in the same fields. Um, but for those, it, it was quite a good signal of, of what was going to, to happen in, in, in the potato fields. I mean, certainly be happy to, to give more details um, through an, an email response. I can confer with Kirsty, who, who would have more details of how many of the fields actually gave a good signal. But I think with all of these things, yes, there are always more questions than, than answers that, that come up. That's a, it's a, a good place to leave it on because it's, it's fantastic work that um, you guys are doing. But I think we've got we've got good good stuff to learn as we continue. So um, if we could move to the the next slide, please. Um, those of you that have um, stuck with us, apologies for for running slightly over, but thank you very much for staying with us. Um, when the webinar finishes, you'll receive a, a short survey. It is very short, takes little time, but um, we do appreciate the feedback, um, constructive um, and otherwise. We're trying to improve these things to make it good for for you guys to take the time to come and join us. Um, this webinar has been recorded, um, so you will receive a, an email link to the recording, and it'll go up on our our website and, and YouTube channel. Um, but finally, there's um, my, my email address and my, my colleague Alice um, in research. Um, so if you have any questions, please do come to us. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, it's a, a series of, of ongoing webinars um, sticking on the soil theme. Um, on <clears throat> excuse me, next Thursday, um, we have a um, potato soil health. Why bother? Um, quite a sort of an out there title, but it's um, generally it's difficult to, to look after the soil when, when growing potatoes when you've got so much machinery going through, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't. So we're starting the, the, the conversation, looking at the research there, um, as well as running through the duration of next week is a strategic cereal farm week. Um, so if you look on our, our website, 
um, you will see the link to all the events happening there. So that just leaves me to, to thank all our speakers. Um, moving on top of my screen, so it's Alice, um, Jean, Andy, and Tracy. Thank you very much for taking your time to share with us what's happening. Um, apologies, there were a few questions we, we were unable to answer, ran out of time, but we will ensure that you, you get an email answer as a follow up. Um, so thank you all very much again, and um, look forward to, to seeing you the next time. Thank you. Thank you.